Hello, so this is chapter 5, and we'll be focusing on contract law, contracts related to uh, electronic transactions. Not only, but mainly related to electronic transactions. So we'll start with uh, by looking at the sources of contract law, and then we'll learn about some of the requirements for a valid contract, for an enforceable contract. And this will um, encompass the requirement of uh, mutual assent, offer and acceptance, also consideration, capacity. So parties need to have capacity to enter into uh, contracts, and then legality of uh, contracts. We we'll also discuss very briefly the writing requirement for some contracts that arise from the statute of frauds, and then we'll move on um, to learn and compare the click wrap agreements and the browse wrap agreements, and we'll discuss briefly as well the enforceability of uh, electronic contracts um, and then look at some of the requirements for those uh, contracts to be enforceable. We'll end this chapter by looking at some specific uh, contract clauses or paragraphs uh, and they are uh, present in most contracts if not all. So that's why we'll be looking at those uh, key clauses for electronic, not only electronic, but contracts in general. So let's start. Well, first of all, the sources of contract law. Where does contract law come from? Where do we find the law for contract law? Where do we find the law which uh, tells us um, what rights, what remedies, what duties we uh, have under a contract. So the main source of contract law is common law. That's the main source. And what is common law? Well, common law, um, you, you saw it, you studied it in our first week of the course. Common law is mainly, not only, but mainly based on judicial decisions, mainly based on case law, on precedents, and those are all synonyms. So that's the main source of contract law, past cases, case law. Uh, but we also have some written uh, sources, some uh, acts or statutes that deal with contract law or that are relevant to contract law. But before we look at uh, some of those, uh, we also need to uh, know that in the US, the restatement of contracts, they are also a source of contract law. However, they have no legal force. It means that they are not a pure legal um, source for contract law. So judges cannot base their decisions solely, only on the restatement of contracts. But they, uh, judges can use uh, the restatement, the principles uh, of contract law that are in the ring statement of contracts as uh, a persuasive, uh, as persuasive. So they may, uh, if they find that a given situation or relationship is well solved, is well uh, dealt with by any of the principles of the restatement of contracts, then they can use as a source. Uh, again, this source is only, not only, only is not the best term, but this source is persuasive in nature, not binding, not 
um, under an obligation because it is not a pure legal source. Hence, it does not have a pure, a direct uh, legal effect. Uh, then we have the UCC, which is a written law uh, code. Uh, this is the Uniform Commercial Code. And the objective of the UCC is to serve as uh, a uniform law, uh, meaning to govern some commercial transactions. Uh, not contract law, purely speaking, uh, but transactions that are uh, usually made under a contract, such as sales of goods. So there are prescriptions, there are rules in the UCC uh, that govern uh, those transactions, those commercial transactions, and they also uh, function as a source of uh, contract law. We also have the United Nations uh, Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods. So this is known as CISG, the acronym uh, CISG. So this convention uh, governs uh, the sales of goods uh, where parties are based in different countries. So one company based in the US is either selling or purchasing goods from or to another party based in South Africa, for example. So parties may decide to have as their applicable law, and you may remember from chapter one, so they may decide to have their applicable law, not the South African law, not the American law, but the CISG. Uh, meaning that the CISG is also uh, a source of law, a source of contract law. And then we have the Uniform Electronic Transactions Act, the UITA. And this uh, act will govern the formation of contracts in electronic format. So contracts, those are the online contracts. So contracts that are entered into, that are offered by uh, online methods. So we have the UETA that recognize, uh, that turn those online contracts uh, as legitimate. And then we have the eSign Act, the eSign Act is, a simil is similar to UITA, but on a federal level. And the eSign Act makes the electronic and paper and ink transaction equally enforceable for any transactions that are interstate or even for uh, foreign transactions. Uh, but again, we are focusing on online contracts now. So online contracts within states, um, they are enforceable, mostly based on the Uniform Electronic Transaction Act and online contracts between uh, two parties from two different states or even from uh, different nations in which one is based in the US. So the eSign Act will make those online contracts uh, enforceable and valid. And there, there are also principles of the law of software contracts. And those principles, they uh, aim to clarify and unify the law of software transactions. And what are those laws? Well, many of the uh, sources we have just discussed. So the principles of the law of software uh, contracts uh, is a way to unify, is a way to clarify the common law that is related to software contracts. Also Article 2 of the UCC, the Uniform uh, Commercial Code. Also federal IP, so federal intellectual property laws that we've uh, seen already. So those principles, they are also a, a source of law. 
So now you know where um, contract law comes from. And I would say the key uh, source will be common law. Not the main, but not the, the only one, but the main one, the key one will be common law. So case law is very important for uh, contract law. So moving on, we'll look at the requirements for a valid contract. Well, a contract is only valid if these requirements are met. And the first requirement is the mutual assent. In other words, it is also uh, explained as meeting of the minds. So two minds, they meet. The two parties that are about to enter into an agreement, they meet. A very simple example here. When you go to Tim Hortons and you order coffee, that's an oral agreement, an oral contract, verbal contract. So you are offering to buy a coffee um, and to pay for that coffee. And Tim Hortons is accepting your offer. Uh, and then they sell you the coffee and they get paid. So it means that the Tim Hortons, um, well, the Tim Hortons uh, representative or uh, server, in your mind, they are meeting. So that's why we call it the meeting of the minds. Okay? So whenever we want to buy something, we are making an offer and this offer is being accepted. This offer, by the way, and also the acceptance, both of them, they may be by, um, they may be implied. They may be by conduct. So uh, let's say you go to a grocery store and you buy uh, watermelon, just a watermelon. So you get the watermelon and you place it on the cashier's desk. And then the cashier uh, will uh, say hi to you and will wait the watermelon and put the price tell you the price so when you placed the watermelon in the cashier's desk on the cashier's uh, desk you didn't say hey uh, I would like to make an offer to buy this watermelon only by conduct by your placing the watermelon on the cashier's desk you made an offer to buy it and the cashier did not accept by saying anything to you but they accepted by waiting, waiting the watermelon and then uh, telling you the price to pay uh, another simple example when you hail uh, for a cab driver so this is by conduct by conduct you are offering you are making an offer for the taxi driver to drive you from where you are to a place you want to go. And by stopping and by picking you up, the taxi driver is actually accepting your offer. Okay? So this offer and acceptance, they form the mutual assent. They form the meeting of the minds. And again, they can be in writing, uh, but in our daily basis, uh, they are usually verbal agreements, oral agreements, as I have just exemplified. And for agreements uh, that are online, so let's say for an agreement for a software you purchase, um, you purchase over the internet, and you have to sign the um, end user license uh, agreement, so the EULAS. Uh, so, how do you accept uh, that offer? So, you click on the I agree. So, clicking I agree is a type of uh, accepting. It is accepting the terms uh, of the sale. So, this is for uh, a software uh, that you buy online or that you have to register uh, online. So, that's the first requirement. Mutual assent, valid offer, sorry, valid offer, and um, valid acceptance. Okay, if you uh, if you make an offer, so let's say um, I go again, I go to Tim Hortons and I say, may I have coffee? 
a small black coffee and they say, mm, I can sell you coffee, but not black coffee. I just have a blonde coffee. So when the terms of the offer are changed in the acceptance, it means there's a counter offer. It means the offer was not accepted and a new offer was made. Okay, uh, another example. Uh, I make an offer to buy your smartphone for 1000 And you say, mm, I can sell it to you, but I'll sell it for uh, 1200 So it means you rejected my offer and you made another offer. Uh, so th this is what a counter offer is. Counter offer is a rejection of the original offer and a new offer. Because the meeting of the minds, um, they only happen when the offer and, uh, better, when the acceptance is unconditional. So when you uh, do not add any other terms to the original offer. If you change the conditions, then the offerer, the person who made the offer initially, they are now in the position to accept because you are making a new offer. Okay? So when there's a counter offer, the offerer will need to accept your counter offer so that uh, your minds uh, meet. The second uh, requirement is consideration. And consideration is the price to be paid. Consideration is something of legal value. So there, there's, there has to be a benefit for both parties. Again, when you buy coffee, your benefit is the coffee. And Tim Horton's benefit is the profit, the money you pay. So there has to be a value exchanged. Something of value has to be exchanged. Could be a service, could be a, uh, yeah, not only money, but could be uh, an item in exchange. But it has to have legal value. Because if you have a gratuitous promise, a gift, uh, gift promise, this contract of a gratuitous promise is not enforceable because this lacks consideration. So let's say, um, I usually tell my students that if they pronounce my name correctly, I will uh, give them extra marks by the end of the uh, term. So this is a gift promise. There's no actually legal value exchange. So if they do pronounce my name correctly, but I don't give them the extra marks, it means this contract is not enforceable. They cannot sue me to enforce. Okay? So only when there's an exchange of something of legal value, a contract is enforceable. Okay? Another very interesting example here. So let's say your boss offers you a raise, promises you a raise better, but there's no exchange. You are not giving anything extra rather than everything you already give in exchange based on your original employment agreement. It's just because your boss came to you and said, hey, I'm giving you a raise by Christmas. So it's this is a gratuitous promise. So hopefully your boss will stick to their promise and give you the raise. But if they don't give you the raise, this contract is not enforceable. Okay? So in principle, not enforceable. There will be exceptions, but I will not enter here uh, into the exceptions. So two requirements here so far. For a contract to be valid, there has to be mutual assent. Uh, assent. So valid offer and effective acceptance. And there has to be consideration. Something of legal value has to be exchanged uh, between the parties. Mm. Uh, moving on, we have capacity. So parties, they need to have capacity to enter into an agreement. So in terms of people, uh, people, they have to, in the US, they have to be 18 years old 
or over to have capacity to enter into contract. Uh, they cannot, people cannot be mentally incapacitated because those who are mentally incapacitated, they have no capacity to enter into agreements. And for minors, so if minors enter into an agreement, uh, the contract is actually voidable. Voidable means, in principle, the contract is valid, but at the option of the minor, the contract may be declared void by the court. Okay, but at the option of the minor. If the minor does not decide to uh, have this contract declared void, then the contract is valid. However, the, the minor cannot get the benefits of the contract and then uh, challenge the uh, contract. This is not possible because the minor would have already um, experienced the benefits of that agreement. Okay? So, issues with capacity, they don't make a contract uh, automatically invalid, void. They make a contract voidable. And again, what voidable? Uh, what does voidable mean? It means that in principle the contract is valid. However, uh, the minor or the party without capacity has the option to have it declared void by a court. Another requirement is on the purpose. The purpose, the subject matter of a contract, has to be legal. Because courts will not help. Courts will not offer any support or help to illegal contracts. So if there's an illegal subject matter in the contract, courts will not help. Uh, meaning, let's say, uh, you hire someone to steal something. So stealing is, this, is the service of stealing something is an illegal subject matter. So the contract is not enforceable at all. The contract is actually not valid. If you uh, buy illegal drugs, and uh, let's say the illegal drugs uh, have issues with quality, you cannot enforce any uh, contractual rights over the seller because drugs are illegal subject matter. So the contract itself is uh, illegal. All right, so uh, this requirement, requirement in writing, is not the general rule. The general rule is that verbal agreements, verbal contracts, are as valid as written ones. However, the statute of frauds, with the intention to prevent fraud and perjury, they have determined that some types of agreements, some types of transactions, they require the contract to be in writing and to be signed. So this is the exception. And the best example here is purchase and sale of real estate. So if you buy a house, if you buy a condo, uh, land, this transaction has to be in writing and signed by the parties, okay? That's the, the main issue here with the statute of frauds, the requirement of writing and uh, signature. Uh, again, this is the exception, not the rule. Uh, is email, uh, does email suffice this writing requirement? Uh, no. Unfortunately, not. So the court held in, in 2009 that the email exchange to buy a house, real estate, would not satisfy the writing requirement. Okay? So it's even though we are already in 2020, uh, but there are still some transactions based on the statute of frauds that require. Um, contracts in writing actually paper paper and ink signature etc 
So that's important. Uh, so moving on, we are going to look at two types of agreements. One is the click wrap, the other is the browse wrap uh, agreement. So the click wrap agreement, well, first of all, let's go back a bit. Uh, some years ago, we can still do this, but some years ago it was more common. We would go to a store, let's say Best Buy or even Staples. You can do this at Staples uh, nowadays. And you would buy software. So you would buy software in a package. And that software, uh, when you um, shrink, when you um, open the packaging, so when you uh, shrink uh, it, it means you have accepted the license. So that's why it comes, uh, that's where the origin of this shrink rep license um, is. And the electronic version, so nowadays we purchase uh, software online and we do not have a package because we do not have a physical product anymore. So the electronic version of the shrink wrap labs, uh, license is known as the click wrap uh, license or click wrap agreement. So it means that when you click, I agree, it is the same act as shrinking, opening the packaging of a uh, physical uh, software you used to buy okay so that's what the clip uh, click wrap agreement is uh, the electronic version when we have the uh, online um, software and the browse wrap agreement they are actually the website terms and conditions so most if not all websites they have their terms and conditions and we usually agree to them. So if we are browsing or using the website, we have to agree uh, to their terms and conditions. And in most cases, website owners, they will have a hyperlink uh, at the bottom of the screen uh, that would take us to their terms and conditions, uh, nowadays privacy terms, etc. So uh, if the terms and conditions are available at the website for the browse wrap agreement, we do not actually need to click to accept the terms and conditions. Uh, it is highly uh, recommended to have the users to click on I accept, I agree to the website terms and conditions. However, it is not required because that is the difference between the click wrap and the browse wrap agreement. So the click wrap, you actually click, I agree to those terms and conditions, etc. However, the browse wrap is just the fact that you are browsing the website and there are terms and conditions there, uh, you have accepted them. However, courts, they actually uh, require website owners to show, to display the terms and conditions in a way that the users, they have actually noticed, they have what is called the actual notice, actual knowledge of the terms and conditions. So that's why I recommend, that's why it is highly recommended to make users to click or if you don't make users to click on the terms and conditions, but at least show them, uh, direct the users to those terms so that you give them, you give the users actual notice, actual knowledge of those terms and conditions. And then you meet the requirement of courts to make your browse wrap agreement uh, enforceable. Okay? So only keeping it there, hidden in the very bottom of the page, is not a guarantee that courts will uh, consider this browse wrap agreement as enforceable. 
uh, so the end user licensing uh, license agreement, the EULA, or terms of uh, use, they are alternative names for could be either the click wrap or the browse wrap agreement. Uh, it will vary based on the circumstances on uh, the product or the service. <clears throat> Uh, so, looking a little bit at the enforceability of um, online contracts, or mainly, uh, better, the browse wrap agreement, as I said, based on this uh, case, the Forest versus uh, Verizon. So, here the court decided that a contract is no less a contract only because it was entered via uh, electronic means. So this case recognized the online contract as enforceable, as with the same legal effects, legal force as a, a physical paper contract. And in terms of the browse wrap agreement, again, I emphasize it is important to have the users, the website users, uh, to have actual or constructive knowledge of the terms. So the easier you make uh, the users to have contact with your terms and conditions, uh, the better it is for you to enforce them in court. Uh, so the last part is some common clauses in the end user uh, license agreement so some clauses for software agreements also terms and conditions first one uh, warranties so there are some that are not some but usually many warranties um, on those agreements however the important aspect here is that the owners of the website or the software providers they can limit their risks. They can limit. They can limit their uh, warranties. So even though there are warranties, uh, warranty that the uh, software will function properly, warranty that uh, the software will be updated uh, regularly, etc. There can be limitation on those warranties. For example, uh, they they may limit their risks on in case the software causes any loss of uh, data. For example, so there are some limitations that are possible, uh, and this is also related to the limitation of liability. So usually in those agreements. Uh, the provider um, ha will have a liquidated damage clause, and the liquidated damage clause means that a fixed amount will be determined for any damages that any parties uh, incur. So let's say uh, $500 uh, will be paid. So regardless of the actual loss, if any party suffers a loss, suffers a damage, and there's a liquidated damages uh, clause, it means that that amount will be paid to that party, to that victim. Uh, this is a way to limit liability because let's say you have a loss of uh, thousands of dollars, but then only $500 uh, is possible uh, based on this liquidated damages. And usually uh, the providers, they also limit uh, the types of damages. So usually there are no special damages, no incidental, no consequential damages uh, there. And the remedies available are, all, are also usually limited. So uh, replacement of the software or a uh, specific amount in the liquidated damages. So it's very, very common to limit uh, the liability of providers. Uh, there may be cases in which the limitation is unconscionable, is not fair. So in some cases, uh, consumer legislation will protect uh, the buyers, uh, the users, the end users. 
Uh, there's usually an arbitration clause. So arbitration is uh, one type of uh, alternative dispute resolution. So parties may go to uh, courts or go to uh, arbitration tribunals or to have one arbitrator. Uh, usually arbitration is faster. Uh, it is similar to court procedure, but it is a private uh, way of solving the dispute. And there are some benefits such as confidentiality, uh, speed. As I said, you know that our countries in which a lawsuit will take years um, and some other uh, benefits we could discuss long uh, here, but uh, it is important to uh, keep in mind when arbitration is in the agreement, parties cannot go to court to solve the merits of the case. Uh, in other words, when parties agree on arbitration, they are waiving their right to go uh, to court. Uh, the identity uh, clause is the clause that uh, allows the injured party to get a reimbursement for their losses or damages uh, from whoever caused the uh, loss. So let's say uh, I purchased a software and then I'm using the software and a copyright owner finds out this software uh, infringes their copyright and they come to sue me, the user. So if there's an identity clause, it means I will pay the compensation for copyright infringement, but I can sue the software provider because they were actually the ones who infringed the copyright. When they used the code of someone else uh, that was copyrighted, they were the ones infringing. So with an identity clause, uh, whoever suffers the loss, because of the other party's conduct, the other party's um, wrongdoing, even if they have to pay uh, or even by suffering the loss, they are able to get a reimburse. They are able to uh, get it back. Uh, the severability clause is the clause that says if one clause or one part of the agreement is declared void, is declared invalid by a court, the remainder of the agreement will stand. So let's say the arbitration clause is not valid. Let's say there are some issues in the arbitration clause. If there is a severability clause as well in the agreement, so the arbitration clause will be taken out. But the agreement itself will be uh, will be considered legal. Uh, it will the invalid um, when one clause becomes invalid, it does not affect the whole agreement. Just that clause is uh, out. The merger clause is the clause that deals with. Uh, getting rid of all previous understandings and agreements of the parties. So once there's a merger clause in an agreement, the agreement will be the main law between the parties. So even if parties had exchanged emails, uh, memorandum of understandings, whatever uh, negotiations they had prior to the agreement, they cannot be used uh, if needed in court because the merge and merger clause uh, says that parties agree that their law from now on is the contract only. So everything um, that affects the parties in that transaction has to be in the agreement, is in the agreement. Parties cannot rely on previous uh, understandings and another uh, the last one uh, the last main clause that are in those end user uh, agreements choice of law and forum selection clause so we saw already in chapter one 
that those are two different clauses. So you can choose the law that will govern the relationship of the parties. And you can also choose the place, the venue, where the disputes will be uh, settled. Uh, so remember, if you choose arbitration, uh, you can still choose the venue. So the arbitration will be in New York, will be in Los Angeles, will be in Paris, will be in Vancouver. So you can choose the type, whether it is a court or arbitration, alternative uh, dispute resolution. But you can choose the venue, the place where uh, the dispute will be settled. So that's the forum selection clause. And the choice of law is what law will govern the situation. So remember we saw uh, also in chapter one and in the beginning sources of uh, contract law. Parties, they can choose the CISG, for example, the uh, Convention on International Sale of Goods. Or parties can choose uh, the law of um, California, the law of New York, the law of the United States, or any other. Uh, laws uh, to govern their transaction. So those are the main uh, clauses that are found in the end user uh, license agreement. Uh, there are many more, as you know, they are usually extensive. Those agreements are usually extensive, but those are the main ones that the textbook uh, brings for uh, your so we come to an end of uh, chapter five where we saw a uh, contract and also contract related to uh, online transactions the e-contract as we can say so we learned about the sources of uh, contract law where the main one is common law and also uh, we saw <coughs> the CISG, we saw the uh, eSign Act uh, and other sources. And then we looked at the requirements of a valid contract being the mutual assent, consideration, capacity, and legality, as we say, or the legal purpose. We also learned about the statute of frauds uh, requirement of writing and signature some some specific types of transactions such as real estate they are required to be in writing and signed by the parties and we also looked at the click wrap agreements which are the electronic version of the shrink wrap agreements and we saw the browse wrap agreements the terms and conditions of a website we also look at the enforceability where of those uh, terms and conditions where the main requirement is that the user uh, has had actual or constructive knowledge of the terms and conditions. And um, we ended by looking at the main clauses for the end user license agreement. So that's it for chapter 5. Uh, talk to you again in chapter 7. Bye now.